Welcome back to my mental health and crime channel. My name is Huda London. This is for entertainment purpose only. I'm a licensed cognitive behavior therapist. That's a CBT therapist and a licensed mental health counselor. This is the case of the Idaho Moscow murders, quadruple murders. Mezana Conodal, Eaton Chippen, Maddie Moog, and Katie Gongalvis, rest in peace, gone too soon. Such beautiful souls at such a young age. Today, I'd like to point out an important thing. That is the reason for the last two months I've started going back to the case in the beginning. I can see that many people, many YouTube creators, I really appreciate, are working hard on on basically the court hearings of the genealogical DNA. The reason I am talking much about it is because luckily there's a lot of coverage about it. My aim from the beginning was to go to the case right from the start. I'll give you an example from the 29th of January, actually the 27th of January, right up to the 26th of June, I was really invested to spread awareness in a case that became really close to my heart. It was the case of Nicola Jane Bully, a 45-year-old mother, from Lancashire, UK, who went for a walk with her dog, dropped her children off to school. And it's a small town, Lancashire. Mikla Bully was reported missing. I personally believe that the case, this is, a le this is for entertainment purpose only, I believe that that case was foul play but the inquest said that she died of drowning. It took 23 days, 24 days to find a body. 23 days, and on the bench it was written number 23. That was a very mysterious case, very sad case, because Nicola's husband was accusing her of being an alcoholic. I hate to say that word, or or having alcohol issues, which was untrue. Nicola's autopsy showed that, showed that she had only a paracetamol in her body. Many people were disappointed, many YouTube creators covered that case, and there are people who are still covering it, which I personally believe is on it's not really necessary because we have to respect the family of Nicola Bully and her, her parents asked the YouTubers and everyone to stop covering this case, but there are many people who cover the case yet because obviously I can understand them. They still want to find out the truth. But I personally stopped the case after the inquest because I have to think like a mental health counselor Nicola has left two daughters behind, two beautiful daughters aged nine and seven years old. And this will affect them, affect the grandparents. The grandparents may be separated, maybe will be separated from their grandchildren if we continue this case. Because honestly, the father of the children 
had a lot of red flags. But that's just an example of when I personally get invested in a case, I like to find out every little bit. Because some things we may think are not important can be actually extremely important. I started the, covering this case of the Idaho Moscow when it came out. I was covering it for three months. And when they arrested Brian Christopher Koberger in December, then the case of Nicola Bully started. So I started covering that case. But I was still following the Idaho case. But now since they say that there are three unidentified male DNAs two in the house and one outside the glove. I want to get to the bottom of this because I've seen a lot of suspicious char characters or people of interest, I would personally say. I believe everyone was ruled out too soon and that's not only my belief. Many people agree to that, I guess. And Kaylee Congalvis's father said himself clearly that he believed that people were ruled out too soon. I found this clip from Law, Crime and Sidebar. Really love that channel. They're extremely professional and they're covering this case of Idaho Moscow from the beginning. And one of their reporters, they are not only reporters, the lawyers too. So one of the l l reporters is actually in Idaho, Moscow, covering the hearings and everything that's going on. In this clip, it will clearly show you all that Brian Enton is interviewed by Law and Crime and I think this was a couple of weeks after the crime, after the quadruple murders, and before Brian Christopher Koberg was arrested. So Brian was called to clear up all the conspiracies and all the errors. You'll clearly see what he says here. And that is, he says that the police and the chief the chief and the prosecutor, Mr. Thompson, I believe, said that it was a targeted incident. And when they were when Brian asked, was the house targeted? Or was the students targeted? The prosecutor said that it the residence was targeted. And later on, they changed their minds and they said the residence wasn't targeted, neither was the house, neither was the students. I don't understand at the start, they have to find the right people. So they're going to dis disclude everything they've said before. And I don't think that's fair. I want justice to be served correctly for these victims, whether it's Brian Christopher Koberger, who's done this horrific quadruple murders, or whether it's someone else who helped him, or it could be possible that Brian Koberger wasn't even involved. But that is my least, least, how do I explain this? That's my least thought because I believe somehow that Brian Cobo is involved. Do you all remember that he made this research asking for participants to get involved basically in his evil plan? And I'm wondering if he actually got participants and maybe he was the one who was running the plan that's the reason no, D, 
his DNA was hard to find besides a leather sheet knife. Allegedly, guys, this is only for entertainment purpose only, but if you don't talk about it, and if you don't try to be mindful, but dig into this case, we will never know what happened. It's clear that there's three unidentified male DNAs, so we need to find out what happened from the beginning. People are literally freaking out here. Like, I mean, I can't like tell you that enough. Like, people don't go out at night. They think the killer is among them here. Um, you know, people have put double locks on their doors. From miscommunications to new details, it's the latest in the investigation of the University of Idaho quadruple homicide case. Senior national correspondent for News Nation Brian Enton joins to discuss what he's learning on the ground in Moscow, Idaho. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Long Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Sir, why not tell the public who the target was? You've said that this was a targeted attack. Why not tell the public who was targeted? If it was multiple people, it would go a long ways to telling the public what you're looking for and who you're looking for, the type of person you're looking for. Why not do that to alleviate some of the fears out there in the community? Well, first and foremost, we have the integrity of the investigation to preserve. And we feel like that information is integral to us and how we conduct our investigation. Releasing that to the public may or may not flood us with a lot of information that's not relevant or specific to what we're looking at. We're continuing our coverage of the university. I find that quite concerning. Because a quadruple murder just happened, the university students are in full-blown panic and anxiety. I do understand that the police have to keep important information to their to their west or keep it to themselves until they figure out what exactly happened. But the chief over here is clearly saying that we do not need information that is not relevant to basically the direction they're taking. How do they know that the direction or whatever they're looking for is the right direction? I don't understand that these are well-trained officers, but when a crime and a quadruple murder, which is rare, happens, you're supposed to look at everybody from the cleaner to the property owners to every person who's put foot in the house, neighbors, co-workers of the victims, where they worked, who they worked for. The corner club should be one place that should be thoroughly investigated because I personally believe everything started from the corner club and it ended from the corner club to the grub truck to a video and then the girls went home. Something happened at home but things don't just happen Someone is planning a plot against these innocent victims. This was a targeted attack. Allegedly. No, actually not allegedly, because the police said that themselves. So I think that it's really unprofessional. The police should have asked each and every information, small, big, because they don't know yet what information they're actually looking for because it took six, seven weeks. It took seven weeks for them to catch Brian Koberger. The fears out there in the community. Well, first and foremost, we have the integrity of the investigation to preserve. And we feel like that information is integral to us and in how we conduct our investigation. Releasing that to the public may or may not flood us with a lot of information that's not relevant or specific to what we're looking at. We're continuing our coverage of the University of Idaho quadruple homicide case. I'm talking about the brutal killings of four students, 21-year-old Kaylee Gonsalves, 
21-year-old Madison Mogan, 20-year-old Zana Kernodal, and 20-year-old Ethan Chapman. Their bodies were found in their off-campus home out in the college town of Moscow with a preliminary coroner report indicating that they had been stabbed to death. No arrests have been made. No suspects have been identified publicly. And while we are learning new details, a major issue in this case is communication, particularly by authorities. So I want to bring in someone who, who can help sort all of this out and give us the latest in the investigation. I'm joined right now by senior national correspondent for News Nation, Brian Enton, who is on the ground in Moscow, Idaho, and has been doing terrific reporting on the subject. Brian, it's great. and Thanks so much for having you uh, here on Sidebar. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Can we start with this kind of weird development we're seeing about who exactly was the target of this? Because that narrative keeps changing from law enforcement to the prosecution's office. Can you walk us through briefly about what we're hearing from each side and how confusing it is? Yeah, it's really, really confusing. Uh, early on, um, police said that this uh, this was targeted and, and we asked for more um information about that for them to elaborate. And they said, we're not going to give you information. You're just going to have to trust us. So this was like a week ago. Um, on Tuesday, I finally got a sit down interview here in Moscow with the prosecutor. Um, and I asked him, what did, what do you mean by targeted? C can you explain this? And he said, you know, to my knowledge with the investigation, we don't have any evidence that one of the victims specifically was targeted but we have evidence, uh, we believe that the residence was targeted. Um, and so that's what we went with. And then yesterday, they basically issue a correction and say that there has been an internal miscommunication between the prosecutor and the detectives who have been in like constant communication, but, uh, you know, works differently in different places, I guess, but the prosecutor is like very involved here in the investigation. Um, so they said there was an internal miscommunication and now they, they cannot say that that any of the victims or the residents was specifically targeted. They, they say that that's all still under investigation. Tuesday, I finally got a sit down interview here in Moscow with the prosecutor. Um, and I asked him, what did what do you mean by targeted? C can you explain this? And he said, you know, to my knowledge with the investigation, we don't have any evidence that one of the victims specifically was targeted. But we have evidence, uh, we believe, that the residence was targeted. Um... Brian Anton is an excellent reporter. You'll heard what he clearly said. That he was told by the prosecutor that the house, the resident was targeted, that they have evidence that the resident was targeted. Then they correct themselves within a couple of days and they said it's a mis-error, it's miscommunication, misunderstanding. The house wasn't targeted and the students wasn't targeted. How could that be a miscommunication? How could there be an error when it was the prosecutor who gave Brian that information. That's very important. I personally believe that the house, the residence was targeted and one, two, or all four, four students were the targets too. Um, and I asked him, what did, what do you mean by targeted? C can you explain this? And he said, you know, to my knowledge with the investigation, we don't have any evidence that one of the victims specifically was targeted, but we have evidence, uh, we believe that the residence was targeted. Um, and so that's what we went with. And then yesterday they basically issue a correction and say that there has been an internal miscommunication between the prosecutor and the detectives who have been in like constant communication, you know, works differently in different places, I guess, but the prosecutor is like very involved here in the investigation. Um, so they said there was an internal miscommunication and now they, they cannot say that, that any of the victims or the residents was specifically targeted. They, they say that that's all still under investigation. 
Yeah, look, just from my point of view, I, it's sometimes every case is different, but to have the lead prosecutor come out at this point when you don't even have a suspect, I, I always found that a little curious. Sometimes it's different in each investigation. I found that, but, but what's the most alarming to me, Brian, is this is not the first time we've had this, right? Wasn't when this first happened, there was a big question about is the public at risk? Is there a public threat? And wasn't there a backtracking of that as well? Yeah, there was. They initially said that the public was not at risk um, and then, of course, got pushed on that because they didn't have any information about who the killer was or what happened or motive and then had to backtrack on that also and say, well, we, we can't really say that. Um, so I think they're trying to walk this line. But I mean, you know how it is. Like, this is a small town. People are literally freaking out here. Like, I mean, I can't, like, tell you that enough. Like, people don't go out at night. They think the killer is among them here. Um, you know, people have put double locks on their doors. I went to the vigil last night. They have, um, you know, uh, metal detectors to get in and police with binoculars up the balconies. So I think they're walking this fine line of trying to keep the community somewhat calm. Um, but at the same time, also being open that like, they don't really know what happened. And it's understandable because they've never been in this situation before. And, and we'll get into kind of what the community is feeling because my understanding is Moscow's a pretty quiet area. There's no, there's nothing like this that ever happens. Just the, from the people you've spoken to on the ground, do they have confidence in law enforcement? Do they have confidence in the investigation right now, given the right hand is, doesn't know what the left hand is saying? It's sort of mixed. And I think it's also changed in the last 24 hours with this admission of an internal miscommunication. Um, but a lot of people here do have confidence. I mean, you know, they, it's a, again, small town. A lot of people know the police officers, the police officers and the prosecutor work very, very closely together. And then there's also the Idaho, Idaho state police who have been brought in and the FBI. There's dozens of FBI agents working on the case behind the scenes, even though the locals are still in charge. So, you know, I think overall people have confidence the victims families have made some comments along the way. Uh, with a bit of frustration, but I think anytime you have something like this that's not solved, um, you know, th there's going to be frustration. And it's been two weeks, three weeks. Again, obviously law enforcement knows more than we do, but if you're sitting in Moscow right now and you're walking the streets, like you said, people are very concerned. You mentioned going to the vigil. What was that like? It was really sad, you know, because I've been very focused on the nitty gritty of the investigation since I've been here, just trying to dig stuff up, stuff up, stuff up, excuse me, stuff up every day. And, you know, not that you don't always think of the victims, but I was at the vigil last night and it's like, oh my gosh, you hear the stories. I mean, three of the families were there talking about these kids um, and it's just heartbreaking. I mean, they were all seemed like incredible kids, you know, hard workers. One was about to graduate, had a job lined up, you know, they were in love. A couple had boyfriends. Um, just, just terrible. Um, and, and again, I mean, you know, it was weird at the vigil too, you know, it was in an indoor arena that you look up in the rafters, they had police with binoculars, they had undercovers, they had a ton of police, the metal detectors I mentioned, there was a very real concern that the killer could show up at the vigil. I mean, even the Dean of students told me that, that they were prepared for that. So, you know, all of that is going on in these people's minds as they're trying to grieve and figure out what's going on in their town. And it was mostly the people there. Did they know the victims personally? Is it more of a community coming together? Because we know that, uh, and we'll get to it in a minute, members of the community, the law enforcement is asking members of the community, if you know something, if you have credible information, come forward with it. The majority of the people that were there, did they personally know the people that were affected, the families, or were they there coming together as a community? I think mostly coming together as a community. I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds. There may have been a thousand people there. It was pretty full. Um, but again, Greek life is huge here at the University of Idaho. I mean, it's really big, and all of the um, victims were in different sororities and fraternities. So, like, everyone in those houses knew the victims, and, you know, everybody partied together. There were a lot of people crying, I noticed, at the vigil, which made me think, like, I think a, and, and, you know, a lot of people knew them. The house was also known to be a party house. They had parties every weekend. So I got the sense that, you know, they had a very large social circle, and a lot of them were at the vigil. We clearly heard Brian saying that the victims had a big social net, and that the house was known to be a party house. So you can imagine how many students, how many different people 
I assume hundreds and hundreds within the last couple of, men, of months have come into this house. We saw at least three bo body cam, police body cam videos. The police came to this resident twice within one night. Once they spoke to Maddie Morgan and the other time they spoke to Zana Konoru. There was a body cam police footage of the police going on the back side of the house and talking to Kaylee Congalvis and Hunter Johnson was sitting there. I really don't understand why this matter wasn't investigated because the police clearly came there a couple of times. Why wasn't there any proper investigation from the police? Why didn't they get, go inside the house and check who exactly was there? We've seen Emma ba Bailey. We all know Emma Bailey and Demetrius for overdosing a boy. May he rest in peace. And they walked away from that case. They were let go. So when you have somebody here, like Emma Bailey, allegedly involved in serious crimes, it makes you question as a human being, what exactly was going on in this house? Could Emma Bailey have just planted in something into the house, allegedly? Who exactly was the victim? is a question, who was the target? The house was targeted and the victims were targeted. That's what I personally believe. And we heard Brian Anton saying that this was a party house. Everyone knows that. May they rest in peace. I'm not saying anything negative about the victims. That's why I'm working hard, just like everybody else, to get justice for these victims. We want the correct people to be arrested for it. At least, thank God, they have Brian Koberger. While they are finding, while they are investigating Brian Koberger and his genealogical DNA, and they're arguing about it in court. I am personally interested in the three male DNA is found in the house. That's written in Inside Edition. You can go check it out. There was allegedly fingerprints on the Good Vibes picture. I don't know if it's the one in Kaylee's room. I believe it's the one in the living room, the corridor. The other fingerprints was the diamond-shaped shoe or the day, uh, diamond soul, oh sorry, the diamond, yeah basically the diamond shape shoe basically under the foot would I say, sorry for that, but you'll understand me. And then we have the leather knife sheet that was found near Maddie. Salvas's father revealed that Kaylee and Madison were killed together in the same bed. Now, I am not sure if we knew that beforehand. What did you make of that comment? Yeah, stunning. We did not know that beforehand. Um, and I wasn't expecting like a big investigative piece to come out during that during the vigil. So that shocked me. Obviously, there's a sad component. I mean, they've been best friends forever, these two. Um, you look at their social media, they, you know, being best friends since they were little kids. So it was just very sad to think about that they got killed together in the bed. But also interesting when you think about the investigation. Um, I was also thinking to myself, you know, we had asked police many times, uh, can you tell us where they were in the house? Can you tell us who was in which room? And they've always said, no, that would really compromise the investigation. So I was also sort of wondering, you know, are police maybe not too pleased that that, that little uh, detail came out? And it's possible that they might be sharing more information with the family than they were with the media and the public, um, maybe not giving everything, but giving them 
some sort of comfort or some sort of details to know that the, the investigation is progressing. Uh, there was something that I want to focus on the house for a second because there, we actually did a show on this. We did a breakdown of the, the house. People have been speculating about, well, where were, there, where were there blood stains? What was collected? We know that the cars have been towed. What is the latest you can tell us about the preservation of that crime scene and what investigators might be doing at this point? So it is still a crime scene. I was there last time I was there was like at midnight. Um, and, uh, you know, they've got the crime scene around the whole place and there is a, um, police car there all the time with a, with an officer monitoring it. Um, they towed the cars away. They said they wanted to do more, uh, investigation on the car. So they're in a secure facility. I asked the prosecutor, how long do you plan to keep it this way with, with the, you know, everything closed off there. And he said his advice to the detectives was keep it as long as you think you might need it. Pay attention to the officer. This is, I think, when they went inside the house and obviously saw the horrific quadruple murders. And you can see it, has, it was a cold day. Look at the officer with the glasses. He has his gloves on. He's rubbing his nose with it, basically. I'm sure he wanted to sneeze or something. But can you picture when he goes back to the scene, the crime scene, he would be definitely carrying his own DNA into the crime scene too. This crime scene was handled in a terrible way and I'm sure it's because Ida Moscow isn't used to a quadruple murder. That is why I'm really upset in this case that the FBI should have been taken over the case immediately. Although it's up to Idaho Moscow to also help when it's such a serious crime. Lack of experience, I don't blame them, but that's the truth, can mess up a case. Is that Chief Roy? Yeah, it is on the right with the beanie hat. And this is the other chief. So we have the two chiefs here. We have the rookie officer rubbing his nose. Chief Fry, how come you don't have gloves on? Mm-hmm. This is strange. Internet sleuths, right? They start coming up with conspiracy theories and rumors. And one of the things that's come out is about a neighbor, somebody who lived by this house, uh, Jeremy Reagan, a third year law student. He himself described, he describes himself as socially awkward. And he has come under particular attention by people on the internet as a suspect. My understanding is he's been ruled out. Um, can you walk us through what you know about him, because he has become a, a, a point of conversation. Yeah, so he was actually on Banfield on News Nation, I think it was last night or the night before. Um, and basically, he did an interview early on uh, with another news agency, I can't remember which one, and says that, you know, he was sort of pulled out of context and made to sound kind of shady. And you mentioned the internet sleuth sort of zeroed in on that and suddenly sort of like targeted him as a suspect when he never really was a suspect. You know, he, he had, you know, he's admits he lives nearby. Um, but, you know, the internet sleuths, listen, they can be really, really great. I mean, you look at other cases, they've literally solved cases before and it's amazing what they can dig up, the manpower that they have. And they go back through every photo and they're on Venmo and they're everywhere looking at every little detail. But in a situation like this, I mean, you got to feel bad for this guy, at least from what we know. You know, it sounds like he just got, you know, called out for, for something that, he, you know, he had nothing to do with. Yeah, and that, you know, they looked at... I personally believe that this whole case was handled very wrong from the start. And I personally believe one of the reasons is because 40% of the income of Idaho Moscow comes from the university. The students work 
around the campus where there's restaurants, shops, supermarkets, wherever. Look at how upset the university principal is. Was his name Mr. Green? They look like they don't want to even answer the reporters. They all are upset. Please like, share and subscribe. Rest in peace to the victims and condolence to their family. May justice be served.